Welcome to Holteras Presents, a brand agnostic interview podcast that seeks to objectively highlight the happenings within the world of diagnostics. And now, your hosts, Rich Thayer and Mickey Yade. Hello, and welcome to Hal Terrace Presents. My name is Rich Thayer, Managing Partner at Hal Terrace Associates. And this is Mickey Yade, Founding Partner at Hal Terrace Associates. As many of you know, shortly after the 9 11 attacks in the United States in 2001, a series of letters containing anthrax were sent to media outlets and to the offices of Senators Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy. That's the subject of a recent Netflix documentary that you might be very interested in called The Anthrax Attacks, that came out last summer. The attacks killed five people and infected 17 others. The FBI indicated that this was one of the largest and most complex investigations in its entire history. It involved more than 9,000 interviews across several continents. Although there was an intense effort after the death of the key suspect, Bruce Ivins, the investigation was halted in 2010. The FBI was convinced they had their man, but there really was no clear proof. In fact, there was no smoking gun. Parallel to the investigation of the people who might have had information concerning the attacks and people who might have been involved, There was a parallel scientific investigation of samples and other materials that were also associated with the attacks. If you saw the Netflix documentary or are aware of this investigation, you will know our guest, Dr. Paul Keim, Executive Director of the Pathogen and Microbiome Institute at Northern Arizona University, really the key figure in those scientific investigations. Today, we will discuss that scientific investigation in more detail than was possible during the Netflix documentary and hear about what he and his colleagues did and what they learned. And now, without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Paul Keim. Well, hello, Paul, and it's wonderful to see you again. And thanks so much for joining us with our podcast. We look forward to talking with you. Please give us a little bit of your background, if you, if you will. Yeah, I'm a kind of a confusing guy, Mickey. Uh, and <laughs> I have to say that uh, I've done science my entire life since I was about 16 when I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, that's all I care about, you know, and doing science is what really keeps me moving day to day. And uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, I, I just enjoy it. It's just personally gratifying. And the areas of science that I've worked on are really diverse. And you know, I've worked on uh, plant genetics. Uh, I constructed the first genetic map of soybean. Uh, I had Oh, wow. That breeding companies trying to hire me when I was 35 years old to start doing genetic maps of soybean and corn and stuff. Uh, I've worked on uh, bacteria. I've worked on protein chemistry. I've worked in diagnostics. Underlying all that, I think, is my love of evolutionary theory and also of just straight genetics, which plays into that really well. Uh, the fact I was originally trained as a protein biochemist has, has really helped out a lot because, as you know, in the early days of molecular biology, we had there were no kits. We had to go out and put reagents together and, and make things work in the lab. And because I was a biochemist, I could. Uh, uh, when I was a postdoc, I remember that we had two types of postdocs. We had the geneticists who were just brilliant, had all these wonderful ideas, but they couldn't do anything at the bench. You know, they were worthless at the bench. Right. Uh, and then there, were the bio- <laughs> then there were people like me who were biochemists. Uh, I'm not sure we had very good ideas, but we could make things work at the bench. And so I spent, you know, about six years at the University of Utah trying to learn genetics, learn evolutionary biology. At the same time, I was uh, developing technologies at the bench that uh, could address those questions. So that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow. So we, we want to talk with you a bit about the scientific work that was done in the anthrax attacks. And um, we'd just like to hear from you. What was so special about your own expertise, the people you worked with, the capabilities of your team that drove the FBI to contact you so early on? Well, I've been, as I, as I mentioned, I had been trained as a plant geneticist. And believe it or not, plant genetics actually tackled some of these DNA typing or DNA identification tools early on. And so uh, I I spent a summer over at Los Alamos National Laboratory in their bio division, and they had a project that they wouldn't tell me anything about because they said it was secret, you know. Uh, I said, okay, whatever. So they got me a security clearance, and it turned out it was on anthrax. 
And so they were trying to do DNA analysis on anthrax in order to differentiate strains or identify specific strains. I said, oh, we've, we've got this problem solved in plant genetics. Let's do it this way. And so I took the methods that we've been using in plant genetics, applied them, and really differentiated strains of anthrax for the very first time. And this was uh, ground shaking. Literally, uh, I went to the anthrax meetings in 1998. We presented our work. And the, uh, the dean of anthrax research, Harry Smith, stood up and said, this is the most exciting thing I've heard at this entire meeting is the ability to tell one strain from another. And the reason it wasn't easy is because uh, Bacillus anthracis, the bacterium that causes anthrax, is what we call a highly adapted clone. Uh, it's actually a Bacillus serious strain that has acquired two virions plasmids, which allowed it to adapt to infecting mammals and giving it a big evolutionary boost because of that. Uh, if you kill a bison, for example, you've got you know two tons of flesh there to grow on, and then it, when the bison dies, all those spores fall in the soil. That is a lot better than sitting around trying to eat the slime off of a, a plant root, for example, if you're a Bacillus cereus. And so the th that type of advantage meant that uh, it, it arose from a single cell sometime in the past and spread around out around the globe, and it didn't evolve very quickly. It was frozen into this niche, and that made it very difficult to tell one, one form of Bacillus anthracis from another form. And without that, uh, researchers were flying blind. And maybe more importantly, uh, the world security agencies that were very concerned about biological weapons were flying blind. Uh, they couldn't tell a strain of anthrax from North America from one in Russia, for example. And uh, so when we started to make this headway, we got a lot of attention from those folks. Uh, most of this funding was through the bio biological divisions at the Department of Energy. Uh, but we also got funded from NIH pre 9-11. I was probably the only one in the United States who had an anthrax related uh, R01. And so we were able to take those methods and start to understand the evolution, uh, understand the geographic distribution of strains and do it with pretty high precision. And so again, it was my ability to use, do things at the bench uh, to do DNA analysis and DNA sequencing, uh, which just hadn't been really popular in, in bacterial uh, genetics. Uh, I think the reason bacterial genetics was uh, was delayed in the molecular biology arena was because they had such elegant experiments they could do. You know, I when I was at the University of Utah, John Ross lab uh, was downstairs, and they would they would take transducing phage and they would infect one strain of Salmonella. They would grab genes and move them over to another strain of Salmonella. They would sit there and construct totally new strains by using these transducing phage. And uh, they didn't need molecular biology. They didn't need to clone genes. Uh, they could just move them around at will. And they could do these, you know, they would sit, sit on the blackboard and draw uh, strains they wanted to construct to ask questions. Uh, they'd spend like, you know, six, eight weeks drawing them out on a chalkboard. And then they'd take a couple of weeks and go construct them and see if their predictions are right. So, but because of that, uh, this molecular biology, molecular genetics uh, bacteria was was kind of delayed. It just wasn't receiving the attention that was necessary to tackle a problem like anthrax. So so we'd, we'd been working on this, uh, again, with folks at Los Alamos, with funding from DOE and NIH. And uh, the FBI certainly knew about this. Uh, we would run off to the FBI and give them talks. Uh, this was the same period of time when human identification was also developing very fast. <clears throat> So the crime lab, which was at Quantico, uh, sorry, the uh, DNA typing lab, which was at Quantico, Virginia, where the, the uh, FBI crime lab is now, uh, they were very interested in this. Uh, they didn't want to do it, but they were very interested in our approach and, and where we were at on it. And so they were tracking us uh, very closely. Uh, when we ended up, uh, when 9-11 happened and then the anthrax letters got sent out, uh, we were the obvious ones to call. It was like Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? Well, it's NAU. 
And there's a couple of reasons that the FBI didn't want to do it themselves. Uh, uh, one of them was, I mean, the main one was, is that they're handling, uh, you know, high consequence pathogens. And while they were very good scientists, very good molecular biologists, very good geneticists, uh, they were not microbiologists. And the crime lab is located on the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia. And the Marine base said, uh, said, you guys are, are guests here. We're not going to let you bring anthrax onto the base. Uh, we don't want to have anything to do with biological weapons. We don't want anybody in the international arena to accuse the U.S. Marine Corps of messing around with biological weapons. And so for political reasons, as well as safety reasons, uh, the FBI couldn't do this. And so when when the anthrax letters went out, uh, they called me immediately. Uh, I was talking to them as soon as the first case occurred so that they could, uh, uh, they were just trying to get background information from an expert at that point. Uh, but then uh, very quickly that escalated to the point where they were sending us uh, samples. Uh, the first sample arrived the night before the first victim died. And uh, we had the culture, we tucked it in the laboratory. Uh, we used our DNA fingerprinting methods, generated a DNA fingerprint, and then compared that to our databases, which weren't enormous, but they were about, we had about 400 different uh, strains in the database at that point. And it matched up with uh, a genotype 82. There were only 89 genotypes at that point in time. That, that was still that was a big improvement over a few years before when there was one genotype <laughs> for all of anthrax. Uh, it, it, it matched up with this one particular genotype, and that genotype uh, was the same as the AIM strain, which was a well-known laboratory strain. That's excellent. Yeah, Paul, that's a very interesting introduction. Thank you. You received a significant number of samples from the FBI we're interested in hearing more about the types of samples that were provided. Um, what were the key technologies that you used in your investigation and what kinds of data were generated? In the short, what did you learn? Well, initially, uh, you know, and in, in, uh, this was October of 2001, again, just weeks after 9-11. The, the initial samples they sent us uh, were from the victims or from uh, the letters eventually. Uh, the, the first victim, when, when he died, uh, we didn't know anything about letters. We had no clue as to how he had been infected. All we really knew was is that he had been infected by uh, a laboratory strain. Uh, he had had pulmonary anthrax, which is one of the scariest forms of anthrax, because uh, when, a, when a, a virus or a bacterium, in this case, gets into your lungs, it's got direct access to the rest of your body, and in a way that can go systemic and uh, go to a fatal situation real fast. So they would send us everything. I mean, uh, literally, they were scraping stuff off of surfaces around Washington and things like that. Uh, the diagnostic or detection assays weren't very good. Uh, they had really poor uh, specificity, as you guys would call it. And so they were sending us stuff that wasn't anthrax. Uh, and and uh, so we would get it and we'd go, well, you know, it doesn't really be, you know, our assays were pretty specific. You know, they, they would not even work well on uh, Bacillus cereus. And we're saying, we're seeing a DNA fingerprint here that is really different than anything we've ever seen on anthrax. So we don't think it's anthrax. You know? And so we, we had a lot of that. And that never, we never actually got any credit for that, which is kind of funny because that maybe was one of the most important things we did was when we could tell them, yeah, this is not part of the crime scene. Uh, there, were, uh, there was an outbreak of anthrax in Nevada, actually, at that, in that same fall of 2001. And we got samples sent by uh, Jet from Reno and they brought them in. We, we typed them and they were anthrax, as it turned out, but they weren't the AIM strain. They were something different. So, again, it was exclusionary. And you, over and over again, you'll hear this with DNA uh, fingerprinting and DNA testing, is that the exclusionary power is, is great with them. In other words, if we can say it's not something, we can usually say that with 100% confidence. Sometimes when we use what we call the inclusionary power, we say, well, it is the AIM strain. It's kind of like, well, it is the AIM strain, but maybe it's a subculture or something like that. So uh, it, that difference uh, it is important. And the conclusions of being able to exclude something meant that the FBI 
was not running around Reno, Nevada, trying to figure out what letters had been sent there. Uh, they were able to focus their attention on what was really important to the case and avoid doing it in, in other places. So those are some of the samples that we got. But uh, the FBI developed a, a subpoena uh, that went out to everybody. So the first thing was is that they didn't know who had anthrax. Uh, they didn't know who had the AIM strain. And so first the subpoena went out to, hey, tell us what strains you have. And as you can imagine, the regulations in the U.S. are quite different today. That's all that information is in a database that they can just uh, go access at the CDC uh, who regulates this, uh, this area. So they had to first find out who had the AIM strain. And then once they found that out, they subpoenaed every single copy of the AIM strain. And they gave very specific instructions on how to go in and sample each one of your cultures. You didn't have to send them your, your the actual tube, but you had to go in and sample in a specific way, make a subculture, and then send that subculture in. Uh, you sent in two copies, and uh, these were auger slants. And so one, one of the, once they came in, and my laboratory had the AIM strain. We had about uh, seven or eight different copies of the AIM strain. So we got the subpoena as well. Uh, we labeled them up, sent them off. And when they went off to uh, Fort Detrick, where they had a team there working in biocontainment laboratory at Fort Detrick, they would take those two tubes and they would put new labels on them, uh, you know, anonymizing them. One of those copies came back to my laboratory, uh, in my case, or from all the other laboratories. So we ended up with about 1,040 uh, of those samples that came from laboratories around the United States, and even from three laboratories uh, in foreign locations. Uh, I think that the foreign locations are certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, maybe Sweden, maybe France. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which other ones, but these were sent voluntarily because the FBI couldn't actually send a subpoena to, to Sweden, say, send us your aim strain. But those came back, and the first thing that we did was uh, tell the FBI whether they were the AIM strain or not. So we went in and did DNA fingerprinting on those. And the uh, it turns out that a lot of people, remember, there were no tools for knowing what strain you had. But a, about 5% of the samples that we got back were not the AIM strain. They'd been mislabeled or mishandled in these other laboratories. So without these methods to identify things precisely through the DNA, uh, laboratorians were flying blind. If they made a mistake in a biosafety cabinet, put the wrong culture in the wrong tube, they never knew it. And that mistake would then be propagated on for a long time. Uh, you guys will probably remember that this happened with HeLa cells. You know, HeLa cells grow great in the laboratory. And so, you know, somebody would be sitting there in a, in, a, in a sterile hood transferring cells around. And just by random chance, you know, one of their cell lines would get HeLa cells in there. And before you know it, the HeLa cells have outgrown everything else. And they end up doing all their experiments on HeLa cells instead of you know, some uh, epidermal cell or something else that they were trying to work on. And so DNA fingerprinting also revolutionized uh, that area of culturing uh, biological material. So first thing we had to do is figure out what the, if they had the AIM strain or not. And so you know, again, about 95% of what we were sent was the AIM strain. And after that, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do for quite a while. We didn't have uh, a whole genome sequence when this started. Uh, to the credit of Rita Caldwell at the National Science Foundation, uh, Maria Giovanni at NIH, and Claire Frazier at Tiger. So Maria and Rita came up with the money, uh, but then, and, and basically under the direction of the FBI, uh, the Institute for Genome Research, or TIGER, which is there in uh, Rockville, Maryland, uh, they would uh, they started sequencing uh, Bacillus anthracis, and so we generated the gene. We would isolate the DNA. Uh, last thing you wanted to send was live anthrax to TIGER. <laughs> <laughs> So we would isolate the DNA, uh, verify that it was uh, spore-free, uh, send it to them, and then they would uh, plug it into their big uh, genome sequencing facility. Now, remember, this is the days when uh, Tiger had basically a warehouse full of applied biosystem sequencers. Now, they were, you know, they were fluorescently labeling uh, DNA, uh, but these were the, uh, the old days when they would be looking at... Uh, 
you know, you have to clone first. Okay, so you'd clone, you'd take the genome DNA that we sent to them, you'd fragment it out into different sizes, but, you know, two, two kilobase was kind of typical. And then what you do is you'd sequence using a universal primer, you'd use Sanger sequencing, sequencing in from the vector into that unknown DNA from the sole sensorasis. And then uh, I think Craig Venter uh, probably deserves a lot of the credit for this is the shotgun approach to genome sequencing was being, had been pioneered at Tiger, where you go in and you just shotgun in all these plasmids, and then you'd start sequencing the ends. Uh, you start sequencing the ends, and the good thing about that was is uh, back in those days, we'd get longer reads, like, you know, 800, 900 bases. Uh, would be typical for one of those. And so from a 2KB clone, we could end up almost getting overlapping ends. But regardless, we had uh, paired ends, and then we would uh, we would sequence wow. enough of these that would have an average of maybe 10x coverage across the entire genome. Uh, the Bacillus anthracis genome is about 5.5 megabases. And so we'd uh, sequence a lot. They would sequence a lot of those clones, and then they would use a computer uh, to look for overlap and pull together what are called contigs. Again, this was the very early days. Uh, there was really only about one bacterium that had been sequenced already, and that was Haemophilus influenza. And Claire Frazier and Tiger had been the ones that had done that. So they were definitely the place in the world to go for genome sequencing. But think about it, you know, here you're, you're cloning into plasmids, you're picking blue, white colonies, you got robots, you know, it, 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 it took a very concerted effort and a large amount of money to sequence that first Bacillus synthesis genome. And even then it wasn't a closed genome. It was probably only about 12 or 15 contigs because getting across some of the repeated regions with that approach was very difficult. So, uh, uh, they were the best, and at the end of that, we had one genome, and it was the Ames genome because it came out of the first victim. But what did we compare it to? You know, it's like, okay, you got one genome. What's it mean? You know, well, it turns out it wasn't all that useful for identifying the source because there was no database to compare it to. But what it was good for was it gave us the chance to develop more advanced diagnostics. And so this whole field moved quickly away from kind of the traditional DNA fingerprinting approach to, to SNP analysis or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And that type of analysis was developed for the AIM strain. We developed uh, PCR, real-time PCR assays uh, for the AIM strain itself that were strain specific. We could run those assays across large sets of, of of strains really fast. Uh, you know, you can set up a 96 well plate with uh, with uh, a, a different strain in each one. Other quantitative, so you'd end up with the information, and uh, and we knew that the specificity was extremely high, and the sensitivity was also very high, and the level of detection uh, was incredible. I mean, we set up experiments where we were detecting single molecules in the laboratory. If we could get a molecule into the, the microtiter dish, I could tell you whether it was the AIM string or not uh, with these assays. Mm -hmm. And uh, the FBI put a lot of money into the development of those. And uh, stories that, again, you'll never hear, uh, but were about false positives. Uh, in the early days of handling this evidence, it turns out that the crime labs, the people at the crime scenes, uh, just didn't have the techniques uh, to 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 generate pristine samples. And so as they got processed, they were getting contaminated by the control DNAs in the different laboratories. Uh, one of the common control DNAs was a vaccine strain called the Stern strain. I should have developed an assay for that because <laughs> it turned out we <laughs> saw that a lot on environmental samples. Uh, you, you know, the FBI, again, was sampling surfaces. Uh, they were literally sampling garbage that came out of ponds in the Frederick, Maryland area. All that stuff, you know, you, you pull some garbage out of a pond, you throw it into a lab to process and extract DNA from it. They send it, they, they get a positive with their assays and they send it to me. And I go, well, it's not the AIM strain. It, yeah, you're right. You've got Bacillus anthracis DNA in there. So again, this idea of excluding and, and helping the FBI so they didn't follow false leads was really important. 
And you don't get to talk about that on a Netflix series. <laughs> That's for sure. That's absolutely fascinating, though. It, it's just uh, incredible. And just thinking about how different the technologies are today. In fact, that, that was one of the areas of the next question we, we had. Between the beginning of that anthrax attack and uh, when the uh, investigation was finally halted in 2010, there are a lot of innovations that occurred in the entire molecular biology space and uh, that could have been applied, but you didn't have an opportunity to apply to what you were doing. So what were some of the key new technologies that came along? What kind of new data could you have been able to generate? And how could that have helped in that investigation? Yeah, so comparative genomics came came of age during this period of time. And we were one of the few labs. There was maybe one other lab in the world that was doing comparative genomics within a single species, single pathogen species, bacterial species like this. So we ended up generating, oh, maybe by 2004, 2005, maybe uh, 20 or 30 whole genome sequences from different strains. And uh, also then started sequencing multiple examples of the AIM strain. And that was really expensive. You know, we're talking a half a million bucks per genome. Uh, and so, and it was laborious. You know, it took us weeks and weeks, uh, months to generate a genome sequence. Uh, in the in the in the laboratory, we had to send them, you know, like ten or twenty or fifty micrograms of DNA. You know, today I'll sequence a genome with one or two nanograms. It's just outrageous. So uh, mm -hmm. somebody had to spend a lot of time under containment, growing and isolating DNA for all that to work. So comparative genomics is what's different. And you know, we were doing all the stuff that we do today, but it just was super expensive and the data sets were really small. Today, you know, we'll generate a thousand genomes and compare them and figure out where things are going. You know, in COVID, uh, COVID, uh, my laboratory alone generated <clears throat> 100,000 COVID uh, genomes for understanding variants and where they came from. Uh, globally, uh, it was in the millions. So uh, in the anthrax investigations, uh, we spent millions of dollars and took years to generate somewhere between 30 and 50 genome sequences so we could do comparisons to identify SNPs and other differences. Uh, but uh, today we can generate thousands of genome sequences for just a few thousand dollars and basically do it overnight. So that's what's different today. Uh, one of the things that was very important in the investigation was identifying uh, variants within the AIM strain that were contained in the anthrax letters. So these were called morphs, and that's because they were identified by microbiology by their morphology on Petri dishes. So as spores were taken out of the letters themselves and plated on Petri dishes, uh, microbiologists at USAMRID noticed that they had different morphologies. And so they started picking those and propagating them and those morphological dif differences held true. And so they would uh, uh, isolate these, they would send them to my laboratory, we would uh, purify DNA out of those. We would send those back to Tiger, where they were then being sequenced by Claire Frazier's operation. And uh, then they would do comparative genomics on those. So this is all from samples that are all the AIM strain. So our DNA fingerprinting methods, both with SNPs, with the, the, the targeted SNPs, and the traditional DNA fingerprinting, all said they were the AIM strain. But there was something different about them based upon their morphology. And by doing whole genome sequencing, they identified those uh, differences in their genomes. And those were mostly related to uh, genes involved with sporulation. And so uh, if, if you sporulate at a different rate, you're going to look different on a Petri dish. And in the end, this became really important to matching up the letters uh, with the, the exact uh, flask of, of, of spores that the FBI thinks that uh, was used to generate this. So there's a flask at USAMRID called RMR1029. It was a, it was a research tool. It was a, a big flask of spores that was being used in vaccine challenge experiments and in uh, therapeutic experiments. So for example, if you wanted to test a new drug, you'd infect a rabbit, you give it the new drug and see if the new drug worked. 
And then, you know, a week later, a month later, a year later, you'd want to repeat the experiment repeat the experiment with a different drug, you'd want to use the same batch of spores because otherwise your experimental results are going to be different. So this RMR-1029 had been developed as a research resource. And it turned out it was a composite of about, about 50 different batches of spores. They've been all mixed together and then stabilized uh, using, you put it over phenol. Phenol won't kill the spores, but it'll kill any vegetative growth. It'll kill anything else any other bacteria that grow in there. So it was stabilized with, with phenol. And so then what would happen is, is you'd go into that and you'd pull out spores and you could get exactly the same spores this week, next week, next year. Well, but what happened in, in, the, in the construction of that resource was that all these different batches had mutants arise or variants arise as we call them in COVID. So the mutants uh, that did really well were the ones that could outgrow the wild type. And so those mutants had to do with sporulation. So if you delay sporulation and you grow vegetatively for a longer period of time, in the end, you, you end up making more spores than the original wild type, which wasn't adapted to do that. And in the genome, there's a number of different mutations that can lead to that phenotype. And so in the end, there were four different morphologies based upon four different mutations that were deemed to be diagnostic for the spores in the in the letters themselves, and so the FBI went back and tried to find those uh, those morphs, those variants in the evidence. Remember the 1,040 different samples we had in my laboratory. They went into the DNAs of those and tried to identify those same morphs. Now we couldn't do that by comparative genome sequencing. That would have broken the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> What they did do is they developed PCR assays around those mutations, and then they screened uh, all the evidence uh, multiple times for those morphs. And when they were done, uh, the only samples in that uh, 1,040 samples, the only samples that had all four of the morphs came from USAMRD. And so they started looking very closely at USAMRD. They went in and discovered that this flask RMR29 was the source for all the ones. Anybody who had those morphs in their in their laboratory, all those were subcultures out of the RMR ten ten twenty nine. Now, the way they did this uh, by first identifying the variants by morphology and then developing PCR assays was roundly criticized by the National uh, Academy of Sciences study that was carried out in two thousand and ten. So Congress gave money to the National Academy of Sciences, said, go, uh, go, we, we want you to evaluate the scientific evidence of the FBI's investigation, the anthrax letters. And one of their criticisms was, is uh, it would have been better if you could have just done direct sequencing and found mu mutations in that mixture without having to first identify the morphs. Because remember, those morphs are under selection. And so if you had two batches if, if you'd repeat the experiment someplace else, you, you would likely find those same mutations in, uh, affecting those same genes in that second experiment. So that means maybe you don't have this direct link between uh, the letters and the RMR1029 that you think you have. So what they recommended and what we would do today was as you do deep sequencing on the spores and the flask and deep sequencing on, on the on the spores and the letters without doing any growth at all, if you can, and then see if the, the repertoire of mutations that you see in one match up with the other ones. And of course, today we could have done that on all 1,040 samples. We could have gone in and developed a panel of mutations that weren't necessarily related to, uh, to the growth patterns, and then we would have been able to see those. Uh, the other thing that they criticized was is the, the morph, uh, the, uh, the mutations that were observed for the morphs were almost all rearrangements, uh, deletions, or some type of an inversion in the chromosome. And so those those are the easiest ones to develop PCR assays around because you have lots of nucleotide differences between priming sites or probe sites in the, in the, in the PCR assays. Uh, SNPs uh, can be done, but that isn't they aren't quite as easy to do. You have to do a competitive probe approach uh, and, which we definitely do today, and we were doing even back then, 
but they didn't identify SNPs. They identified rearrangements in these morphs. And so uh, the National Academy of Sciences said, well, if you could identify SNPs, they're more likely to be neutral and be uh, a very specific to a batch approach to producing spores as opposed to uh, these rearrangements, which could happen independently, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish those. So uh, we definitely take that to heart today when we do this type of analysis uh, and looking for signatures inside of a particular batch uh, that we do deep sequencing. Uh, Illumina technology is what we is kind of the workhorse for sequencing today. Uh, its sequencing error is definitely less than one percent. In many cases, we find that the error rate is uh, maybe as low as 0.2%, which means we can identify mixtures down to about, you know, definitely below 1 in 100, maybe below 1 in 200. But that type of uh, mixture analysis, we can actually go into uh, batches of DNA, spores in this case, and we can look and identify these mixtures, and then we can ask if those mixtures match up across different batches. I'm curious, could you tell something about the number of generations of growth after the wild type as a result of that type of a deep analysis? Uh, we, we, we couldn't. And um, it's a good question whether we'd be able to do it or not. Uh, it would take, we'd have to, so what you're asking is, is about molecular clock analysis. And with Correct. some, with some pathogens, the molecular clocks are really good. You know, with COVID, it's really good. We know that it accumulates about one new mutation every two weeks, and that's been almost constant across the entire pandemic. Uh, with certain bacteria, it works really well, as it, too. It doesn't work so well with anthrax, and uh, we have tried to calibrate the molecular clock, again, by doing laboratory growth experiments or by going out and isolating Bacillus anthracis from nature and using the isolation dates as a way to calibrate. And it, it, it isn't statistically significant. In other words, we have a way to tell uh, whether the number we come up with really works or not. And it doesn't. And why it doesn't uh, isn't perfectly clear. Uh, first, I thought it was because it was a spore former. And in the spore, uh, very few mutations occur it's kind of like putting the, the genome into a time capsule. And because the spore sits around for one year or 10 years, uh, when it comes out and starts growing again, it's going to have the same number of mutations, zero. And so it'd be identical, even though you've got 10 years, nine years different in clock. We call it the wall clock. <laughs> and so <laughs> because of that, uh, we, uh, we, we, we would have loved to have done that in the case of the bacillus anthracis uh, in the anthrax letters, uh, but we couldn't at that time. And even today, I think we'd have to do a lot of basic research to us to validate uh, that molecular clock basis. That's in contrast to, again, to other pathogens where it works really, really well. Uh, for example, uh, when, when we analyzed the genomes of the, uh, the outbreak of cholera in Haiti, we actually were able to go back and set a molecular clock date to the exact week when the Nepalese peacekeepers showed up in Haiti and started pooping in the water there and spreading cholera to everybody. And, and there was an error, you know, there's a, you know, plus and minus 95% confidence intervals around that estimate. But man, it was right, right on that, that week when they showed up. So it can be an incredibly valuable tool if you have the right biology and the right data set. Uh, but in this particular case, it didn't work. So if you, if you think back now to all the things that transpired, and this has been really very interesting. I, I really appreciate all the information you've shared with us. Um, you think back now to all the things that transpired and additional technology which have been uh, developed. And do you think it would have been possible today to develop a, a true smoking gun and identify the perpetrator? Or would you have required other things beyond the, the molecular biology, um, surveillance technologies? But what would happen today in such a circumstance? Yeah, uh, let me digress for just a second. Uh, the reason why people love DNA is because in the courts today, juries hear that, you know, that the DNA 
you know, from a blood stain matches up with somebody exactly, or, you know, in sexual assault cases, a, a semen stain matches up with somebody. You know, if, if you have a semen stain and the DNA fingerprint matches a perpetrator, you don't need anything else, right? I mean, that alone will convict somebody. In the case of microbial forensics, you don't get that. What you get is, is you get a match to the agent that was used, okay? And then what you have to do is tie that agent to the person. Uh, so, for example, if somebody kills somebody with a knife and you can put the knife at the scene, then you've got to put that knife in that person's hand. And that's what happens with microbial forensics is we can identify the precise flask and the per- the exact lot of a bacteria. We, we can do all that, but somebody's got to put that knife, put that bacteria in the perpetrator's hand. So the FBI, when they investigated this, they were looking for that. You know, So like on the envelopes, they went in to look for human DNA. Uh, they looked for latent prints, you know, the fingerprints, the real fingerprints. They looked for hairs and fibers. They did all that stuff. You know, the letters themselves were self-adhesive letters. Can you imagine if somebody licked an envelope full of anthrax spores? Well, if they'd licked the envelope, then they would have been able to get a human identification from that. You don't get that from the spores itself. Uh, You end up with a, uh, a target of where you can go, but you still have to uh, go back to the actual perpetrator. Uh, The, um, I think that this was also true in HIV cases, you know, so this same approach has been used to identify people who transmit HIV to, uh, to a victim. And there's been uh, multiple cases where uh, people have been convicted of of assault, you know, by infecting their sexual partners with HIV. And so it's been a controversial approach, but what they've done is, is they've looked at the, the genetic sequences of the HIV virus and they uh, looked at that for, you know, for from the victim who, n- who is now infected, and they've looked at that from the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator, and then they compared that to databases. And so that's a little bit closer because then you're actually taking that virus directly from their body. So you can imagine that in that particular case, you could actually have the smoking gun. But in this biological weapons where uh, you, it isn't intimately involved with the perpetrator's body, I think that it's always going to require that additional uh, investigative gumshoe approach to uh, identifying who could have done it. And that's what the FBI did with Bruce Ivins is they, uh, you know, they narrowed it down to the first a few hundred people and then to maybe a, a dozen people uh, who uh who had access to RMR 1029. And they started eliminating those people uh, based upon their alibis, where they were. Uh, They knew that the letters were mailed from Princeton, New Jersey. And so whoever had mailed those letters had to be within driving distance or have a uh, accomplished at, at least. And so they started narrowing the circle using more traditional investigative approaches once they knew it was RMR 1029. And I think that that's still the place we're at in most cases. Paul, this has been a fascinating discussion. And of course, we would hope not to see an event like the anthrax attack again. But were that to happen today, how would you recommend proceeding with scientific investigation? And perhaps, you know, on top of that, are there lessons learned from the response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that might make that response uh, different today than, than in the past? Yeah, I think, you know, our surveillance methods globally are much better than they used to be uh, for genomic surveillance. And that's clear with the pandemic and the tracking of variants in in real time. I mean, how amazing is it that we would see these variants arise in Great Britain and then we'd be able to sit there and anticipate when they're going to get to the Western U.S. where we all live. And so I think that, uh, you know, we have learned a lot. Uh, The technologies that we develop are being applied Uh, globally now in really big programs. Uh, You know, after uh, 9-11 and the the anthrax attacks, the U.S. government stepped forward and said, hey, we need an FBI laboratory that can handle pathogens. And so they went out and spent a few billion dollars and bought one, right? Uh, As opposed to my laboratory, which was operating on a shoestring, (laughs) relatively speaking. I mean, for all the money they spent, 
on my laboratory during the uh, anthrax investigation, it was a very, very small fraction of the billions of dollars they've spent on infrastructure since then. So right now, the uh, the investigation would go to the FBI at uh, in Fort Detrick, where they built their own high containment laboratory. That laboratory has full genome state-of-the-art sequencing. They would definitely sequence everything. They would be doing deep sequencing on all the samples. You know, one thing that is is amazing, though, is is real-time PCR, uh, even based upon SNPs, is a technology that's held up. You know, that's still one of the best technologies out there for going in and uh, detecting a single molecule of DNA, for example, on a surface or on a sample. Uh, you, You can go and sequence a lot. Uh, and I suppose you might be able to do the same thing. Uh, but with the with the real-time PCR, you can do replicates, you can validate it, uh, you can develop you know, all the parameters, uh, validate all the parameters that are necessary. So that's still a technology that uh, 20 years later is one that I would advocate for, for doing. You know, once you've got a target and you know what it is, uh, get some really robust assays and keep doing them over and over again. But you know, again, the deep sequencing, the metagenomic sequencing is all going to allow you to discover things in, in an unbiased fashion that you can't with those directed uh, PCR assays. Uh, I think that uh, genomic technology is uh, among the most universal in this field of investigation. Uh, the FBI uh, had you know people looking at the different stable isotopes. Uh, looking at the C14 unstable isotopes in the spores. Uh, They were looking at all sorts of trace evidence inside of the spores using all sorts of fancy mass spec analyses. All those things um, are are good technology, but they really didn't generate the information that we did with our genomic approaches. And our genomic approaches will work with any living organism. Okay, so whatever you can imagine, Uh, genomic analysis is going to be critical for trying to understand that and maybe directing other types of analyses in to get further information about how it was grown or, uh, you know, or even, you know, the the batches. So, for example, they used the uh, the bomb spike, the C-14 bomb spike from the atmospheric testing to estimate the age of the spores. Well, that was good. They figured out that the spores weren't made 20 years ago. They were definitely made in the last couple of years. That wasn't really a, a big investigative lead. It was accurate, but not really a big one. But maybe that would be important in the future. So there are other technologies that can be applied, but the core one has to be the genetic identification of what the agent is. Fascinating. Because we had so much money in this crisis situation, we were able to do comparative genomics uh, before anybody else was. And, but all of the approaches that we developed in that time period, uh, you know, 2000 and and one, 2002, uh, have come to fruition now. And so now when you can sequence a bacterial genome for a dollar or two, uh, you can go out, anybody can go out and do comparative genomics and ask very interesting questions about where something came from. And so I, I th- it, it was a great time to be doing science because the technology was evolving super fast, you know. Uh, literally every six months, something would be better. You know, uh, we had the Applied Biosystems 373 uh, when we started. And then soon after that, we got the 377. And before you knew it, we had capillary machines. Instead of pouring slab gels, we had capillary machines. And then, of course, then we got the uh, uh, the short read uh, Illumina type sequencers going at the, at the very end. So... When technology is changing that fast, you're able to ask questions that you've always wanted to ask, get answers that you've always wanted answers to, and you, we were getting it in real time. I mean, it was just riding the best wave you ever surfed in your life. You know, you just just got on there and hung on. And frankly, it hasn't changed. I mean, the technology is still improving dramatically. Uh, the logistics of getting the genomes in the lab and getting them sequenced. Uh, is still important. You know, run the, running a biocontainment lab has not gotten easier. <laughs> That's actually gotten harder. Uh, and because the technology improvements haven't made our lives easier there, and the regulatory environment has gotten tougher. You know, 
uh, even today with the questions about the origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2, you know, the oversight of laboratories like mine have gotten more and more intense. A lot of folks have gotten out of this business because they just didn't think that the um, that it was important enough, or they didn't have enough money to keep doing it. We've hung in there, and so NAU is one of the places in the country that has one of the best managed uh, biocontainment labs of these types of pathogens. Uh, we're the only yeah. laboratory in the United States that gets perfect inspections from the CDC. Uh, they come in and they inspect us, and typical is they'll have 10 or 20 findings about things you need to improve. Uh, for the last about six years, we've had perfect inspections. Like they say, no, nope, you're doing it right. So, well, congratulations. That's not easy. It, no, it's not. It's a very impressive place. I, I, I've really enjoyed going through it. It's just amazing. So beautifully organized. We got, we got a really good team. So, Paul, what are some of the open questions? that you could answer with comparative genetics in uh, uh, pathogens are, are still on the table that you want to tackle? So uh, sequencing, you know, the genomes of, of isolates is pretty routine now, and we can do that. Uh, I think the big, uh, the big challenge that we're still uh, trying to approach is sequencing samples that don't involve a single isolated colony. So in other words, what we call metagenomic analysis. So if we take, you know, a gut sample from your stool and uh, we just start sequencing it like crazy with just unbiased, deep sequencing, first problem we have is is that most of that DNA that we sequence is is your DNA. And if we're really interested in sequencing your genome, I'll just take, take some blood and isolate DNA from that. What we're really interested in understanding is the bacterial community that's inside your body. Uh, you guys probably know this, that, you know, that there's as many bacteria in your body as there are human cells. You know, the microbiome right. is uh, mm-hmm. very complex. Uh, we estimate there are maybe uh, 10,000 times more bacterial genes in your body than there are human genes. And think about all that information, all those metabolic pathways and how they interact. There's absolutely no doubt that they're a part of our biology, part of our physiology, the way we function. You know, we know that the bacteria in your gut affect the way you think, even uh, through the secondary metabolites that they have. So with genomic technology, we would like to be able to go in and start to figure that all out. But we're really limited uh, both with our sequencing depth, in other words, being able to go in. Uh, The length of our reads are not long enough really to identify things just at random like that. And then having the computer capacity to analyze a network that involves that many genes and that many potential pathways is still lacking. So, you know, I expect us to be seeing a lot of improvements in uh, machine learning in the future to help us understand the data that we can generate and expect us to be looking at some really, really big data sets here in the future as well. Fantastic. You know, it's interesting. I was at the CDC maybe 10, 15 years ago, and Eric Lander was hosted this session, and uh, they were trying to figure out how genomics could help uh, infectious diseases. And we kept saying it's surveillance. That's where it's really important is surveillance, you know. And so uh, Charles Chu there at UCSF, um, I guess he's still at the China Basin thing. He's certainly been one of the leaders in this area of doing metagenomics for diagnostics. Uh, You know, the promise of doing being able to do metagenomics or even, uh, you know, targeted multi amplicon sequencing is something we've worked on a lot at TGen, uh, which is, of course, my other uh, laboratory. And there's absolutely no doubt that it works, but it just hasn't caught on. You know, if you go in a clinical lab today, you're not going to find a sequencer, but you'll find a lot of these really good Biomeriu, the old Idaho technology PCR assays. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the, those assays have caught on. And I, I, I think that the sequencing in some ways has just changed, been changing so rapidly that we haven't been able to standardize it to the point that we put it into the laboratory on a routine basis. Because tomorrow there's going to be a new sequencer, right? And then... Uh, whereas yeah. with PCR machines, they've, they've been pretty much the same uh, the same platform for 20 years. 
definitely improved, but nevertheless, the same underlying technology and primers and assay. Yeah. So uh, it really takes somebody like Charles, who's got a CLIA lab where he can stand up protocols and uh, do it kind of in a homebrew, an LDT type approach, as opposed to uh, being able to sell it. You know, uh, uh, Pack Bio and Illumina both kind of reached into that space and backed off, you know, uh, as yeah. far as actually doing sequencing as a diagnostic. So it's clearly an incredible research tool, but in some ways it's got to stop getting better for it to be a, a, a yeah. clinical diagnostic tool. You know, that's a fascinating yeah. comment and one that, you know, it's interesting uh, how well you appreciate that, you know, Folks don't understand how long it takes to standardize and adopt as standard practice technologies and diagnostics. Right, right. One, one last thing I was you made me think of with the metagenomics and meta sequencing is the progress has been going on in uh, library prep methodologies. For sure. You know, using very large numbers of probes, for instance, to capture by hybridization or large numbers of PCR primers. The Twist Bioscience has, I think, 160,000 sequences in one of their library prep methodologies, like every virus anybody's ever heard of is in there. Yeah. So yeah, well, we, is we, that going to help? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, we love Twist. Uh, they're a little bit expensive, and so we still use Agilent. Uh, we can buy uh, 244,000 oligos uh, from Agilent, you know, unique oligos that we program yeah. for about $4,000. So they're a little really? bit cheaper than Twist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they you know they use the photolithography uh, and then they just clean right. them off, and so we've got some great uh, high you know high density array type liquid arrays uh, based upon the oligosynthesis. So that's a revolution, absolutely. The yeah. ability to make complex mixtures of oligonucleotides for an affordable price uh, has changed our lives. Wow, oh, we could talk forever here. You know, we sequence ancient ancient genomes of uh, plague, for example. You know, and those are based upon yeah. these RNA baits, uh, where you know you hybridize and then you pull it out right. and enrich and then sequence. Right. I keep reading stories in New York Times or whatever with global warming, right, and, and the tundra thawing, and you know what's going to get released, what's available now from folks that weren't buried all that deeply and perhaps were preserved pretty well. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the big issues today uh, that's bouncing around uh, thanks to COVID is this gain of function. And so virologists in particular have been, have been able to go out and create viruses with new functions, you know, and they do this to try to help us understand, you know, the Im immunological evasion methods. Can, you know, can, can a virus beat a, uh, a vaccine? Uh, can it develop drug resistance like HIV? And so, you know, if you take a virus and you select four variants, you can figure that out. And so all those experiments are, are useful, but they're what we call gain of function. You're taking a virus and giving it a new function. And sometimes those functions can help it evade a drug or evade a vaccine. And so they have to be done very carefully, and you want to be sure that you're doing them uh, in a way that's going to lead to a, an important benefit for mankind. Uh, and so the regulations associated with this have become really important. Uh, back in 2000 and back in 2010, uh, there was a, uh, a two different groups of scientists who figured out how to take the avian uh, high path H5N1 and make it transmissible from mammal to mammal. This is a virus that when it did infect people, when it does infect people, it kills uh, 60 to 70% of the people that it infects. But luckily it doesn't transmit human to human. It's really a bird virus. And it, that has to do with its receptors and how it binds to sugars. Uh, but these scientists figured out how to make it transmissible from one ferret to another, and then likely from one human to another. And so if you take a virus like that, that kills 70% of the people that it infects, you could have a pretty major impact on the world. Uh, you know, uh, COVID has is, is been massively destructive, but a virus like that would be even worse. And so when these scientists who had been funded by NIH were announcing that they had done this, uh, NIH in particular 
took a, a dim view of what was going on there and sent it to my committee at the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, or NSABB. And our committee decided that they shouldn't be allowed to publish their results because it's very feasible to take a genome sequence of a virus and just plug it into another virus. So once you publish that data, a whole host of laboratories around the world can repeat that work very easily. Well, it turns out that uh, the scientists who were announcing this were maybe uh, overstating their case for what they had done. And in fact, uh, this virus wasn't nearly as dangerous as they said it was. So eventually we reversed ourselves, but it took about a year or two of careful thought uh, to convince uh, the, the scientific magazines, which were the Science Magazine and Nature, which were publishing these two papers, for them to turn around and release those papers and the data associated with it. So this whole area of gain of function is, is still a very important area for us to think about. And unfortunately, we have to have more than just scientists making these decisions. You can't just let a scientist go off into the laboratory and do an experiment like this without some input from, uh, from the public and from the government. And so that's what's happening now is this area has become highly regulated in the United States uh, so that uh, scientists are, have to interact with policymakers and the public before they do a dangerous experiment like I just described. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you once again. This has been wonderful. We greatly appreciate your, your time and your, your knowledge and uh, just having you here has been a great pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Well, I, I thought our conversation with Paul was really fascinating. He had been working on the methodologies to look at sequence differences in anthrax. And, you know, more, I think, from a basic scientific point of view, it's, it's really quite a fascinating thing to do. But here comes along these anthrax attacks. And suddenly this becomes an extraordinarily important tool in determining the origins of that strain, where it came from. And it worked remarkably well. It's just, it's just really fascinating that uh, this, this area of science was so important for that investigation and now has importance in many other aspects of, of uh, forensics and basic science. It's just become an entirely new field. I agree with you, Mickey. It's truly incredible how, how readily science was able to be adapted to the anthrax scare. I'm just wondering if we fast forward to today, are there opportunities to use similar types of, of technology? In this case, it was uh, used to identify the strains of the, the anthrax, but also to be able to identify individuals involved. So sort of a forensic, you know, a deeper dive on the forensics. Right. It, it seems that it is. I mean, we know the importance of eDNA, environmental DNA now, that you, you find DNA all over. We can find it in... Um, soil, we can find it on people's shoes, we can find it uh, in the toilets, we can find it all over, including on objects like perhaps those letters. Wouldn't it have been interesting to, if at the time we had known about this, being able to actually take samples from the letters themselves and, uh, and look at the presence of particular human uh, DNA on it. Now, it isn't as though everyone necessarily has a very specific sequence you can look at, but there are methods now of looking at, for instance, short tandem repeats in particular areas on, on the chromosomes. And the pattern of them is something the FBI uses today to have a pretty good indication that a particular individual contributed to that DNA by looking at theirs versus this. The, the, the odds of having that particular pattern are, are quite low. So you can imagine that that kind of evidence could have been supplementary to the anthrax and perhaps, you know, being able to look at Bruce Ivins and they would have been able to identify that. Who knows? They, they destroyed all that evidence. So it's just a shame because today you might have been able to go back and do something like that. Yes. Who knows? Well, thank you for joining us on this episode with Dr. Paul Kine. Yes, thanks so much. And we hope you found this both enjoyable and informative. This is Rich there. And this is Mickey Yarday. We look forward to having you join us on our next episode of How Terrorists Presents. 
Holteras Presents is produced by Holteras Associates, a US-based bioscience consultancy that provides strategic and tactical services in the areas of diagnostics, medical devices, and life science research to clients of all sizes. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the episode are solely those of the individuals involved, and Holteras Associates is not responsible for any errors or omissions or for the results obtained from the use of this information. The information provided in this episode is for informational or educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Holteras Associates would like to say thank you to this episode's guest or guests and thank you for listening to this episode of Holteras Presents. Thank you.